Dr. Sanguinetti, thank you for your time. My pleasure. And thank you very much for your decision to accept to be a member of the Global Energies Board of Trustees. Now, we have 540,000 US dollars as our annual fund. My tragedy, however, is that there are not so many Latin Americans who have participated in the nomination for the prize. Hopefully there will be more. Now, my other tragedy is that we are talking about all of this and about sustainable development with the pandemic, the COVID in the background. Can we talk about sustainable development under the circumstances? More than ever. Today, more than ever, we can talk about sustainable development. We are going through an unexpected situation that has put all balances in crisis and has shown us more than ever the need for a necessary balance in nature, in development. With risks, this can also generate certain authoritarianisms. It can generate a specific omnisapience that goes beyond the natural importance that science has achieved at the moment. But I believe that more than ever we must return to a balanced normality. Balanced on what? We have three categories in the price, conventional energy, alternative energy and new applications of energy. With the development of science, there are more and more truly modern technologies in the field of energy, but much of this leads to a situation where jobs are being cut. What is the balance between technologies, the well-being of the society and the disappearance of traditional jobs? That's the story of mankind. Every time a great invention has appeared, the world of work has been changed. It happened with the Industrial Revolution that drove people out of the fields to the factories. A time of economic exploitation came, social legislation was born as a response. The Industrial Revolution began in the countryside. There has always been a transformation of people. We are analog, and now we have to move on to a different world, where wealth is different, values added are different, where the communication between humans is different. That is the great challenge of education. Education is inevitably the solution, as it has always been throughout history. Now, we are in Montevideo. Your political movement is called Foro Bajista, after Baji Iordonius, the founder of modern Uruguay. Great social and political reformer. And we, Russians, are very grateful to him, because he was who launched here the idea of a state monopoly on oil and green oil in the country, which led to the blockade of Uruguay by the oil companies of that time from American England and the arrival on the shores of the Rio Plate of what was called Neft, the Russian oil, that created the Uruguayan word Nafta. So we are grateful. But this is not him. This is the uncle. This is the great reformer from 1903 to 1915. The one who introduced Russian oil was his nephew, Luis Batel Beres. He was my teacher, president in 1947. And as a parliamentarian in 1931, he presented the project to create our Royal Institute. And here comes the Russian NAFTA. There comes the NAFTA. Now that we're talking about petrol and oil, we are in the 21st century, in which the most advanced scientists of this planet have decided, and we agree with this, that climate change has CO2 emissions as the basis of the problem. So the issue is to reduce the use of oil and natural gas and to go towards something nicer. The fashionable topic now is the hydrogen which, when you burn it, does not produce CO2. We all have studied it in the secondary school. The technology in question is the hydrolysis. You take the energy from the air, the wind, the solar energy, you use that electricity for hydrolysis, and you produce the hydrogen. All very nice. The problem is that this green hydrogen produced from the air costs six times more compared to traditional hydrogen where CO2 is involved. In some northern countries, Large segments of the population say yes, they are willing to pay more for cleaning up the planet. When you come with ideas like this to the developing world, and you say you have to pay three times more from next week, people say, hmm, and go out on the street. What is the solution? I think it's step by step. Our country started its hydroelectric revolution in the 1930s which continued until around the 1960s. The first big dam was Rincón del Bonet. It was made by a German company in the year 1930, 31. Now we have wind energy production, which is very important. I would say that, in terms of the normal balance, we have nothing but water and wind. 
energy to fossil fuels is only an exception. Well, yes, but then you are in a very favorable area for this. It's windy in Uruguay. There are countries where there is no wind. So, we have a very good development. On days like this, we are at 60% wind and 40% hydraulic. There is the sun. And the sun is yet to develop a lot more. It's just beginning. We are also starting in the automotive sector. We have another thing that has been helping us a lot as well. The trees. We have planted many trees. I think that has been very important. But this is a very Uruguayan example. Can we talk about a truly respectful dialogue between North and South in terms of technology in general terms? There are times when countries like, say, Germany say to African countries, you must follow our path. But it's our path means uh, a much higher price that is not an adequate price for a developing world. When we say North and South, we mean very different things. Europe's relationship with Africa, for example, is not the same as that of the United States with Latin America. They are different cultural and historical situations. Dialogue is always possible and necessary. Even today, in our Latin America, there is a much greater openness, even international. The Caribbean is much more influenced by the United States, Central America, the Caribbean, Mexico. In the South, we have a greater historical connection with Europe. It goes from France, Spain, Italy, the countries that populated us, to Russia. That was always present as well. But today, there is China as well. And China is today the first or second largest commercial client of most of our countries. Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay. There is a very large diversification. I think this is not bad. This is good. Yes, the more mosaic there is, the better. Everything has an action and produces a reaction. This is life. This is development. And energy, which is what moves the world, moves us all. There are more and more sources of energy every day. As you yourself were saying just now. That's how we learned, little by little. First, it was the fire. The wood. The wood. Then, different processes were generated that allowed more development. We have taken important steps. We should take others. In a country without climate, where wind and the sun are much more logical than the hydroelectric plant that was the first. Hydroelectric power is easier when there is waterfall. Here we had to make a huge lake for our first dam. But let the Russians live with our fossils because they work. They can be burned in a much more cultured way. The fossil may not burn as well. It can be raw material. Sure, and it can also capture CO2. Such technologies exist. It can also be raw material. I would say more. The least useful use is to burn it. Yes, that's true. The best thing to do is to transform it. Yes, so Russian NAFTA will keep coming here. The best thing to do is to transform it. And it's possible. What is synthetic? And how much the synthetic has allowed a better life? As it has become popular, for example, in clothing. Before, good clothing was only for very few people. Today, everyone can keep itself warm, can protect themselves well from the cold. That is the development of the synthetics. I am an advocate of wool, because this is a country of wool. Dr. Sanginetti, thank you so much. My pleasure.